Hello class, Professor Mandeville here. Uh, this is the first lecture for chapter 16 in your textbook for History 102. And what we're going to be starting to cover is the Second Industrial Revolution in America, as your textbook does in the beginning of that chapter. And specifically, this lecture is about railroads and the construction of the first transcontinental railroad in 1868-1869. So, first of all, a little introductory material on this second uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, which took place in America in the post-Civil War era. And to give you an idea, this is when industry really takes off in America, and we catch up with our European counterparts and in fact, by, the, by 1892, we will surpass all of them in industrial capacity. Uh, the United States will turn into a real industrial powerhouse, and it will also uh, be centered in the North, and specifically in the Northeast. And to give you an idea of this concentration of industrial capacity, especially in the Northeast, uh, by 1890, 85% of all industrial capacity was located uh, in the Northeast. And uh, New York uh, was producing industrially as a state twice as much as the entire former Confederacy combined in industrial capacity. So the South remained an agrarian society. The North really blossomed industrially. And one thing that really fueled this uh, giant boom in industry is railroads in many different aspects. Uh, not just simply the transportation network it established, which was, you know, a stat part of it was established by the Civil War, and will be greatly expanded upon after, but also just the demand for certain materials like steel will really fuel the economic growth, especially in the steel industry and related areas uh, during the Gilded Age. So, first of all, uh, with railroads, uh, you're going to see a massive increase uh, in the number, <coughs> excuse me, of miles of tracks in the United States during the Gilded Age. You have a map you're going to want to refer to in your textbook on page 594, where you can see this network evolving by 1880. That map shows you. But to give you an idea, at the end of the Civil War, the United States had 35,000 miles of railroad tracks. By 1900, we had more than 192,000 miles of railroad tracks in our country. That is a tremendous amount of expansion in a 35-year time period. And the thing that really set it off was the construction of the first transcontinental railroad. Now, the planning for the first transcontinental railroad that would essentially, in essence, connect New York City to San Francisco, even though before the Civil War, New York City was connected by rail to Chicago. So the real construction is going to be connecting Chicago to San Francisco to complete this transcontinental path. The planning had been done in the 1850s before the Civil War even started. In fact, one of the motivating factors behind the famous Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1856 was people, uh, you know, anticipating the future path of this transcontinental railroad. So the plans were all set for it, and the government had already decided they were going to pay for the construction of this railroad, it was so important. And one of the motivating factors for the government 
<clears throat> was the gold rush that happened in California starting in 1849. The government needed a secure method to transport the billions of dollars worth of gold and silver being on earth out west to the banks in the east. And railroads were the way to do this. Obviously, Pony Express and Stagecoach wasn't. And to ship it, you'd have to sail all the way around the tip of South America. So a railroad was vital. The federal government decided we'll pay for it. We need it so badly. So the planning was there, but what uh, stalled the construction, obviously, was the onset of the Civil War in 1861. So the plans are kind of put up on a shelf. You're not going to build a transcontinental railroad during the middle of a civil war such as ours. So after the war ends in April of 1865, it isn't long before people in Congress start reconsidering this plan. And finally, they're going to start construction <clears throat> on the Transcontinental Railroad in 1868. And two companies are going to end up controlling the two different halves of the Transcontinental Railroad that essentially runs from Chicago to San Francisco. And if you look at that map closely on page 594, you'll notice that the area basically from Chicago to the Salt Lake City area is labeled Union Pacific. <clears throat> so that's the company that is going to build, be reimbursed for building it, uh, building the uh, Transcontinental Railroad essentially from uh, Chicago to present-day Salt Lake City, Utah. And the other company involved is going to be, as you can see on the map, the Central Pacific Railroad Company, which essentially is going to build the tracks and control the railroad from San Francisco to Salt Lake City. They're going to build far less mileage of tracks, but that's because they have to build right through the middle of the Rocky Mountains, which is going to be slow, arduous work. <clears throat> so, this construction will begin in 1868, and there's a lot of naysayers. A lot of people say it's impossible. They'll never build a railroad through the middle of the Rocky Mountains. This is a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. But, obviously, it did happen. But it was pretty miraculous when you consider what they had to do. So, they're going to be working on this for over a year and the fateful day, which becomes known as the wedding of the rails, is going to happen on May 10th, 1869 in Promontory Point, Utah. Now, I've given you some links in the mini lecture language there. There's a national park there. You can visit the links, explore it, because this was quite an event. So what's going to happen on this fateful day, uh, they had put a lot of planning into this beforehand. <clears throat> you know, by the end of April, they knew approximately whereabouts the two companies, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railroad tracks would meet up north of the Great Salt Lake. <clears throat> and, there, and it's going to be a huge ceremony that they're going to put on to complete this monumental task. As I said before, some things a lot of people thought was impossible and would never happen. So, on May 10th, 1869, dignitaries from the East will travel by rail uh, to Promontory Point on the Union Pacific Railroad. Dignitaries from the West will travel from San Francisco on the Central Pacific Railroad Company's train. And the two trains will sort of meet face to face. Now, if you go to that website, you're going to see photographs, <clears throat> excuse me, of this famous event and whatnot. Uh, unfortunately, your textbook doesn't have pictures of it uh, because the pictures are pretty famous. So anyway, I'm going to explain it to you. You can look at the pictures at the website uh, of the Wedding of the Rails in Promontory Point. The two trains are face-to-face. -face. There's a big ceremony. All these dignitaries are there. 
Uh, when you look at the picture, you'll see a couple of uh, guys hanging off the fronts of the trains, holding bottles of champagne. They brought in numerous cases of champagne for this event to celebrate it. They had specially made a sledgehammer to drive in the final spike. If you're familiar with railroads, railroad uh, tracks are held on to the railroad ties with long spikes that are driven in. Today, machines do it. <clears throat> Back in 1868, 1869, men swinging sledgehammers drove these spikes in to hold the rails onto uh, you know, the ties, which are made out of wood. So they had a specially manufactured solid silver sledgehammer, which is in the museum at Promontory Point, to drive in a ceremonial final spike that was made out of solid gold. <clears throat> now, obviously, after they did that, they removed the spike, saved it, and today it's in that National Park Museum. So the person who gets the honor of driving in this ceremonial spike with the silver, excuse me, sledgehammer, is Leland Stanford. Leland Stanford is the owner of the Central Pacific Railroad, former governor of the state of California. I'm going to talk a little bit more about his amazing life uh, shortly. So, at a set time on May 10th, Leland Stanford is supposed to drive in this ceremonial golden spike, but it goes further than that. When you look at that map on page 594, you see all these railroad lines. Next to every single railroad line, they string telegraph lines. And not only did this complete a transportation route from New York to San Francisco, it completed a communication route for instantaneous communications between New York and San Francisco and beyond. So every single little railroad station back in this day and age had a telegraph station where you could go and send messages to people. So at that fateful day, May 10th, 1869, when Stanford drives in that golden spike, it's gonna trigger a telegraph message that'll be sent to every single telegraph station in the country to tell the country this monumental feat has been accomplished. So on that day, crowds of people form outside of telegraph stations, railroad stations, all across the nation to hear personally the telegraph operator run out of the station and read that telegraph message. It's such a big deal. So, Stanford gets the honor of doing this. Uh, according to what I've read about this uh, day and this event, the dignitaries had sort of prematurely that morning opened up many of the cases of champagne and were partaking of champagne before the ceremony even began. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this before, but uh, I can remember in my past going to a Sunday brunch at a restaurant and, you know, at 11 o'clock in the morning or whatever, having a mimosa, which is champagne and orange juice, sort of as your celebratory orange juice while you have your brunch <clears throat> and drinking those at 10 or 11 in the morning can catch up to you very quickly, and before you know it, you're feeling no pain. You only do that a couple times, and then you learn that's not the best thing to be doing. Or maybe you like it, I don't know. So, uh, that's sort of the uh, feeling that obviously Leland Stanford had that day. So he gets up there to do partake in the ceremony, drive that spike home with the solid silver sledgehammer, and on his first attempt, according to eyewitness reports, he missed the spike 
and doing so, it caused him to fall right on his ass. Now, not to be discouraged and being a little tipsy, the crowd all cheered and laughed and so forth. He got back up, dusted himself off, took much more care with his second attempt, hit the golden spike head on, drove it in, triggered the telegraph message that was sent throughout the entire country and it wouldn't be long before adoring crowds across the nation were cheering at the top of their lungs that the first transcontinental railroad had been completed. Now, I like to compare this event to something that happened nearly 100 years later. And it's these kind of comparisons that make history really fun to me. The event I'm referring to happened in July of 1969 when Neil Armstrong stepped out onto the surface of the moon, being the first person in the world to do so, and people all across America were glued to their televisions to watch this faithful event take place, just like people were uh, formed in crowds outside of railroad stations in 1869 to hear the message that the railroad was complete. These two events are very similar. Back in 1869, completing this railroad, building it through the Rocky Mountains was the equivalent to putting a man on the moon in 1869. Or, excuse me, 1969. A lot of people thought it would never happen. A lot of people thought President John F. Kennedy, in his famous Inauguration Day speech in January of 1961, when he said, before the end of the decade, an American will walk on the moon, a lot of people thought he was a crackpot and didn't know what he was talking about. But lo and behold, July 1969, Neil Armstrong was walking around on the moon. So, another way that these two events were very, very similar, they both acted as healing events after a time of crisis. This uh, transcontinental railroad event in May of 1869 is really the first thing after the Civil War that all Americans, North and South, black and white, had to be happy about. The Civil War, as you, you know, have to know by now, and the initial Reconstruction period was hell on earth to Americans. And finally, we got something we can rejoice in. When we study the 1960s, you're going to discover, if you already don't know, the decade of the 1960s, for many people, was hell on earth also. We lost President John F. Kennedy to an assassin's bullet. We lost Dr. Martin Luther King to an assassin's bullet. We lost Robert Kennedy. We lost Medgar Evers. The country was exploding. It was in a state of rebellion. The civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, senior citizens known as Gray Panthers marching in the streets for their rights. All hell was breaking loose in the 60s. But in July of 1969, all Americans could unite and be very proud in our accomplishment of putting Neil Armstrong on the moon. I can remember as a little boy going over to my great aunt's house to watch this event because she had a color TV and we only had a black and white one. And a lot of the family was at my Aunt Seal's house to watch this event take place in front of her new color TV. And boy, oh boy, were people excited and happy. And it happened in every household across America. So that is a very significant event. And it really then triggered the construction of rail more railroads coast to coast, linking up everything and evolving to the point, as I mentioned before, we went from 35,000 miles of railroad tracks in 1865 to over 192,000 miles of tracks by 1900. 
So the final thing I want to talk to you about in this lecture, sticking to the topic, is I want to tell you about the life of Leland Stanford. The guy who fell down on his first attempt to drive that golden spike home and the owner in 1869 of the Central Pacific Railroad Company. Leland Stanford was originally from the East. He traveled to California during the gold rush, but he didn't go there to prospect for gold. Back in the East, he was a hardware store owner and he had figured out <clears throat> that a shovel and a pick that he sold in his hardware store back east was selling in the gold fields of California in 1849-1850 for not the 50 cents it sold back east, but for five bucks a piece. So he went to California to set up hardware operations and he made a small fortune very quickly selling equipment that he transported to the West to the prospectors uh, who were in the gold fields. <coughs> he parlayed that success into a political career and was elected governor of California after they became a state. And then he used his money to become a railroad tycoon, and he is the one who got the contract for the Central Pacific Railroad Company, which as you might imagine, being the Western half of the first transcontinental railroad made him enormous sums of money. Now, Leland Stanford, you know, we're gonna be talking about the industrial, second industrial revolution, and a couple terms that we're gonna be tossing out there, or one anyway, is the term robber baron. There were a lot, or I should say, there was a handful of people who made extraordinary amounts of money during the Gilded Age, one being Andrew Carnegie, another being John D. Rockefeller, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Leland Stanford. <clears throat> and the ones who are termed robber barons were greedy bastards who just hoarded their money, made the money off the backs of laborers, and just exploited people. Now, Leland Stanford was not a robber baron. And let me explain to you the actions of he and his wife that took place that separates him from a lot of these greedy industrialists. Uh, Leland Stanford made a tremendous amount of money off the Central Pacific Railroad Company. And Leland and his wife only had one child, a son. Now this son had turned 18. He was preparing to go back east to start college at an Ivy League institution. I don't remember which one in particular. It was either Princeton, Yale, or Harvard. And uh, during that summer before he was getting ready to hop on a train and travel back east, start his college career, he was killed in a horrible accident. And obviously, he, it broke his mother and father's heart. He was their only child, and to lose your child, uh, you know, any parent would give up their life in a second to save the life of any of their children. I know I would. And I know my mother and father would and so forth. So they're heartbroken, they're mourning. Once they get over the mourning period, they decide that they're going to do something in the honor of their lost son. And what they decide to do is they want to build the greatest higher educational institution west of the Mississippi River. But before they embark on that project, they decide they're gonna do it right. So instead of their son hopping on a train and traveling east to the Ivy League schools, Leland Stanford and his wife do. They tour Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, talk to the presidents of those esteemed institutions and tell them what they're up to and ask for their advice on how they should go about it, since they've already been around quite some time and were very successful. Then they hopped on a ship and went to Europe 
and visited the great educational institutions uh, like the Sorbonne in Paris, Cambridge University in England, and so forth, to really figure out how to do this. Then they returned back to California. They bought a huge tract of land in Palo Alto, California, in the San Francisco area, and they started the construction of Stanford University in the honor of their son. Now, they did it correctly. Stanford is even nicknamed the Harvard of the West. It is by far the greatest higher educational institution uh, west of the Mississippi with a highly esteemed med school, law school, and so forth. Many Supreme Court justices went to Stanford Law School. So they did it right. They built Stanford. And then when they passed away, they left their fortune to Stanford University in the form of an endowment in their son's name. And Stanford University is still spending portions of the Stanford endowment every year because it's invested and basically they spend the income off it. They'll have it forever. So Leland Stanford was anything but a robber baron, but circumstances in his life, you know, obviously you could argue caused him to have a different view on humanity and so forth. So that's the end of this lecture. I'll be back in a few minutes after I have drink water and stretch my legs. And I'm going to talk to you more about railroads and the Industrial Revolution in America. So I'll talk to you soon. Bye now.